As the vehicles made their way across France, the convoy attempted to split into its various designated groups, and the true scale of the operation ahead started to become clear. Even if people were professional drivers and had done something like this before, you face all sorts of logistical difficulties. Refueling, stops for toilet breaks, stops for prayer break breaks, stops for, for food, uh, where people are going to sleep of an evening and so on. So all of those are big things to organise uh, under any circumstances. But these were entirely volunteer people. The road through France was only the start of this epic journey. But already it was becoming apparent that the long hours and hard driving involved were placing a huge amount of stress on both the drivers and their vehicles. Brother, we've broken down, we've had a blowout, we've filled up with tyre wall, the wheels split, um, and we're on just before junction 17. Yeah, every, a lot of people have gone, bro. They've, they've passed us because we've been here for the last half an hour trying to take it off. That's life. What can we do? Receptions had been planned further south in the Spanish city of San Sebastian and in the Spanish capital, Madrid. But delays due to breakdowns meant that most of the convoy pushed on to the Spanish coast, bypassing the formalities. Meanwhile, Press TV, which had been embedded with the group since London, was busy keeping the rest of the world up to date. Yes, that's right. I'm here in Port Tarifa on a bitterly cold morning. It's about 6.30 uh, here and it really is very, very cold. As you can see behind me, most of the vehicles for Viva Palestina convoy have gathered to get the ferry to Tangiers in Morocco. We're there was lots of work to be done. Uh, it was challenging, it was very tiring, um, but at the same time, it was a fantastic opportunity to, uh, to make history, which is what I believe Press TV did by taking part in that convoy. I don't know if the camera can look at it, it's a little shoebox, and there are 50 of these shoeboxes from the children of Rochdale. Members of the convoy weren't quite sure what to expect when they boarded the ferry from Spain to Morocco early that morning. In diplomatic terms, the ride had been relatively smooth so far although media interest had been lacking. And although they were told to prepare for a massive welcome, there were questions among some over how the government would react to a collective with such wide-ranging political backgrounds. Overall, politics across North Africa is, is different from, from within Europe. The local authorities and national authorities do things differently. There are different customs. Uh, in general, the uh, police and security agencies have a, have a much bigger presence. Some of those governments would be worried about the presence of uh, people with a radical political message about Palestine. But upon setting down on the North African coast, there was indeed a warm welcome from the police and government officials, and the media was out in force in contrast to the previous stops throughout mainland Europe. There was a qualitative uh, leap in the, uh, in the whole way that the whole thing was uh, viewed. It was uh, a different ballgame, as, as I was confident it would be. The Palestinian people need this. They need it uh, uh, practically and they need it symbolically. Because symbolically, our caravan can inspire others from all around the world. And all roads now should lead to Gaza. It feels good that we're in sunshine. I feel that a big load's been given. Alhamdulillah, if you hear the azan, can you hear the azan? We're ready to pray, brother, and I feel great. But the joy was soon soured for some as the convoy carrying medicine and aid for the people of Gaza was checked vehicle by vehicle by a pack of sniffer dogs, then driven through a large X-ray device and given another thorough security check. One driver was even detained for an hour before he could leave the ferry. Although the police were polite and civil, the process delayed the convoy's departure from the port of Tangier. Now they're giving us hassle about what goods have you got in the, in the back, we want to search them. I mean, this is the first time all of this has started since we left. 
basically they've got a lot of security on and I think a lot of people were intimidated by it. And there was disappointment amongst all when it was revealed that the government was cancelling plans for a major rally in the historic city of Casablanca, where more than 100,000 well-wishers were expected. The reason why remained unclear. It's unfortunate that our uh, planned events in, in Casablanca, which is a huge city with millions of uh, citizens, uh, has been cancelled for uh, internal reasons. Uh, reasons uh, of state, uh, raison d'état, as they say here. But despite the low point when the convoy reached the streets of Tangier, it was obvious that the Moroccan people had a huge amount of support for the Gaza mission. They've been standing on hilltops, uh, outside buildings, everywhere, everywhere you can think of, those people have been waiting and waving. They've been waiting for us. While some remained disappointed by the government's earlier behaviour, others welcomed the hospitality laid out for the convoy and insisted that the police had provided them with a huge amount of support as they traversed the kingdom's highways. The whole Moroccan government has been looking after us very well and we are, we are very much satisfied from what they've uh, provided. We hope that this support continues in Arab countries inshallah. because we need the moral support with us as well. We need that to, to guide us into Gaza, inshallah. Viva Palestina was now into its second week on the road and its time in Morocco was coming to an end. The drivers were ready to push on through North Africa but little did they know that George Galloway and his team of organisers were involved in a flurry of diplomatic activity behind the scenes in order to make sure the next leg of the journey actually happened. The land border between Morocco and Algeria had been sealed shut since 1994 due to a diplomatic standoff and animosity between the two was so strong that Algeria had initially been insisting the convoy would not go through. We were negotiating with the Moroccan and Algerian authorities to prevail upon them to say, look, we're not asking you to make any kind of public or diplomatic change in your position, but simply to allow this convoy to, to go through. I spent many, many long hours negotiating the opening of that border. There were moments when um, it looked as if we'd have to abandon those two countries altogether and, uh, and head straight for Libya. Um, there were moments of farce when it looked like we'd have to drive through Morocco, then go back to Spain and then get a boat from Spain to Algeria. Eventually it was agreed that the border was to be opened. But although the Moroccan public had come out to bid the convoy farewell, there remained an element of uncertainty as the long line of vehicles from Britain snaked towards the crossing point overnight.